so folks, what we have tonight is the wall of Donald Trump's delusion shattering. It's been cracked, obviously, for years now, ever since the last election where he got walloped by Joseph Robinette Biden Jr., the real president, by like 7 million votes. But it's been holding up and been patched up. But today it's shattered and his dementia isn't saving him anymore. And there's a final realization by Trump that his life is ruined, his company is ruined. And whatever reprieve he got through the bond stuff, the arrival of this criminal trial, now starting in just a matter of days in the grand scheme of things, is breaking him and all of this is exposing him it exposes him as a man as a business person as a politician as a citizen all of that and there's one particular moment here where a trump insider talks about the mental breakdown of donald trump how this is hitting him so much more personally than maybe even i thought maybe you did as well so hit the like and subscribe button again trumpers are trying to delete my channel I've had to resist, urge, uh, you know, attacks by them in the last little bit. So hit that like and subscribe button. Let's go mega viral together so we can fight back against MAGA. And the last clip in particular, guys, it shows that Donald Trump is a mental mess. Became pretty dramatic. It was dramatic, Nicole. And one of the things that really struck me today is Todd Blanche is a person known in the New York legal community for his collegiality, a person who is easy for everyone to get along with. It was one of the hallmarks of his tenure in the Southern District of New York as a prosecutor, where he served, as Mershon elicited from him today, nine years as a prosecutor, four years as a paralegal. But increasingly, even the very friendly collegial Todd Blanche is being forced into postures that are at odds with what I think Todd Blanche has done best in his career as a lawyer, which is get along with folks and try to find common ground. Because what he did today, according to Judge Mershon, was dramatic and uncalled for. He, in multiple pages of emotion that Mershon went through in painstaking detail, accused the DA's office of prosecutorial misconduct, blatant discovery violations, and, as he put it at one point, trying to make the judge complicit in those accusations, too, by saying, like, hey, the DA's office is not complying with their good faith obligations here, and you're going along with it. And while he did eventually extract a 30-day adjournment out of it and got no further, in the process of that, squandered so much credibility with the court before jury selection has even began that while this is part of Trump's usual MO, delay, stall, and ignore, delay, stall, and ignore again, he really didn't get much out of it other than really angering the judge who will preside over, as you noted, his first ever criminal trial. And so just remind everyone what this is about. This is about SDNY's documents or documents about Michael Cohen. Right. And they had a case that was going and they ultimately, you know, it didn't go forward and there was documents that were not turned over. And so in the late in the game, they they ended up and like in recent weeks, ended up turning them over. And this caused what happened today. What did what did, what do you make about where we stand right now, sort of on the precipice of the first ever criminal trial of Donald Trump over this of all? I mean, this is I mean, I it, it be, makes it trivial to talk about them like like some sort of fantasy basketball bracket. But but of <laughs> all of the alleged criminality on Trump's part, this is the one for which there are copies of checks signed by Trump in the Oval Office where there is there are recipients of the money who don't doubt the you know, don't call into question or doubt the alleged relationships or relations or the nature of them. There's an election that we all know happened. So, so, so the facts are so well established, not just by witness testimony, but by documents. What do you expect as this gets underway? Well, it is interesting that this is the one that is going to go forward and it's still in question whether the other ones will. People say this is, you know, people have called it the weakest case. I don't know if that's true, but it's a very unusual case. But at the same time, I think it is fairly cinematic and I think could be strong to sell to a jury. You have a payment to a porn star in the final weeks of an election in order to influence the outcome to silence her. And other evidence will be brought in about other payments that were made. The Access Hollywood tape can't be played, but it will be the tape will be or the, the you know, the transcript will be read in. Hmm. It's going to be very dramatic. And I think this is something that a jury will be it will be easily understood versus, you know, the last trial that the last trial in front of Judge Mershon that I sat through involving Donald Trump. 
It was pretty complicated. That was the criminal trial for tax fraud. This one is not. I understand there's you know issues with it, and it's novel in terms of getting you know it kicked up to a fraud and all that. But I think a jury will understand it. You know, the, the idea that a jury is going to have to process these pieces of information, I mean, I, I've heard it disparaged privately and I guess increasingly right. publicly as the least serious. I mean, I think it's also the most obvious. That's what I per, Perhaps with the exception of, of E. Jean. I mean, it, it is the facts, again, are not in dispute. There, there are checks signed by Trump written in the Oval Office. Um, there is a a real live porn star yep. who I think is the witness in this. And there's a guy who went to jail who didn't have any sex with a porn star and who did. I mean, the, the facts are so clear. Took money from a home equity line of credit to pay her. <laughs> and what's alleged and here went is to jail. <laughs> right. Went to jail. And what's alleged here is the crime. And I think people mostly forget is what happened afterwards. It's the way in which they tried to paper over the alleged campaign finance violation. Alvin Bragg doesn't have to prove that there was, in fact, any violation of federal or state law with respect to campaign finance. What he has to show is that there was a falsification of business records mm -hmm. in an attempt to commit or conceal another crime. And that's the crime for which Michael Cohen went to jail. And we could all discuss whether other people should have been imprisoned as well, including but not limited to Donald Trump. But that's really the crime here. It's not the payoff of the porn star. It's the cover up of the payoff of the porn star in order to make sure that the American people didn't know that he paid Stormy Daniels and for what purpose and in what timing. It was a time frame where you and I, Nicole, have discussed the campaign was in meltdown. There was a catastrophe going on. They understood that they were in big trouble with white women voters and they were trying as best as they could to minimize that damage. And lo and behold, Stormy Daniels manifests and she wants her money. And sure enough, they make it happen. And more importantly, Michael Cohen makes it happen with Trump's say so. And to, to your other point, this isn't just a testimony and documents case. This might also be an audio tape case. We mm. all forget about the fact that there is audio taped evidence that the boss understood what the payment was being made for. You can expect that that audio tape likely will resurface at this trial. Right. You were going to say something. Well, I just think that we talk about the pressure they were under. It's that Access Hollywood thing. Correct. I mean, if this wasn't a trial, it should be a movie, and maybe it will be <laughs> Correct. both. Correct. But that Access Hollywood tape was bearing down on the campaign when Correct. this happened. And that's not going to be played in court. I don't think you need to, because that was the shot heard around the world. Absolutely. And everybody is, they can... They're going to be read the transcript in the courtroom, the jurors, they're going to be able to visualize that. But that was the stress that they were under. And it's, it is very cinematic when you think about it. Well, and that political, you know, to the degree that there's a, a political part of what may or may not be presented to mm -hmm. the jury, that tape is what made Reince Priebus say, this is it, we're out. We've got to flip yeah. the ticket and put, <clears throat> um, you know, put pens at the top. That tape is what created a political calamity where I think that was the first time only Rudy Giuliani went out of the Sunday shows. Reince Priebus refused yeah. to do it. Yeah. I think, uh, I don't know if Jared was a spokesperson yet, but no one from the family would go out. I mean, that did create a cataclysmic political moment for Trump's candidacy. It did. The tape uh, recorded Donald Trump laughing and bragging about sexual assault. And as much as Republicans tried to dance around that moment, I'm concerned about it. I don't like it. It's sexual assault, what he was describing. And so the campaign started to fall apart, as Lisa and Sue have pointed out. And so what did Donald Trump reach for to remedy his problem? Fraud. Fraud. And this, I, what I think is fascinating about this case in particular is it's the intersection of Donald Trump, the business person, and Donald Trump, the candidate. And, and this narrative of fraud is kind of a thread through all of his cases, including January 6th, where he's charged with conspiracy to defraud the American people of their own vote, of their own democracy. Right. And so in this case, we learned through Tish James his willingness to engage in business fraud and tax fraud. That's the charges, the 30 plus indictments center around business fraud in New York. But the underlying narrative is why did he engage in that? Because as Donald Trump, the candidate, he had to reach for fraud to save his own campaign. That's a powerful reminder during a year in which he's running for the White House again, that this is who he is. And the voters yeah. aren't going to miss that. Hey, everyone. MSNBC has a new and improved app. You'll get real-time alerts and analysis, live blogs, in-depth essays, video highlights, and the best 2024 election coverage. Download the new MSNBC app. Here's how to do it. You tap on the App Store on your phone. You hit search on the bottom right corner. You type in MSNBC. You click on the MSNBC app. You click on get or the cloud icon. 
and enjoy it. Here is back on. We've updated these charts. The, the defendant here has so many cases that we have to mark them, but we've tried to give you a color coding that makes it pretty clear. I mentioned that there are legitimate questions before the Supreme Court in the coup trial. That's in red. That is basically pause and delayed on appeal. Tonight, for the first time, we've updated the hush money back to green with April 15th. That is the headline. And let me tell you one more thing about this before I explain the other legal updates we got today. And that is this. Donald Trump is not someone who is running for office again under any normal circumstances. He knows that. His fans know that. They talk about the witch hunt, as they call it, all the time. And the public knows that. But whether or not this thing ever gets resolved under the law, gets completed, is a huge question. Some people are tired. I get it. Some people are fatigued. Some people say it takes too long. Those are all feelings. But this process is not supposed to be about feelings or delay tactics. And it's not supposed to be about railroading someone. It is very unprecedented, as you've heard, to have any presidential candidate facing a trial, let alone potentially four. And so the defendant here, whether people like it or not, under our system, does have rights. For example, I mentioned the kind of things you can appeal before trial and the kind of things you usually can't. The fact that he is availing himself of his rights with his lawyers it may frustrate the opposition and the prosecutors, but that's fine. That is allowed. That is the system we have. On the other hand, the news tonight is something we didn't have yesterday. We didn't have last week. This trial is back on. And if this trial in New York occurs in April, begins as scheduled in April, which is now confirmed by the judge tonight, that means in all likelihood there will be a full criminal trial of Donald Trump, the first ever of a former president. And there will be a result. And if there is a result, I can tell you it will either be a verdict Guilty, not guilty, or a hung jury, what they call a mistrial. Those are the only three options. I can't predict which one will happen, but I can tell you there's only three under the system. And so if Donald Trump was hoping to delay this because he's so afraid of the result, he's so afraid that the verdict could be guilty, whether or not that even results in prison time, for his purposes, it might result in a few more people around the country deciding they don't want to vote for a convicted criminal for president. That's not a crazy reach. We certainly don't have any indications or polling that people prefer a convicted candidate. And Donald Trump knows that very well. That's why he spent so much time trying to convince everyone that Hillary was back under investigation or crooked. That's why he went after Biden, who he saw politically accurately as his biggest rival, and tried to pretend there was criminal investigations of him in Ukraine. And when there weren't, he tried to abuse, as we know, foreign power policy to create the appearance of one. Donald Trump knows very well that being convicted is bad politics. What do you think it'll be like, though? I mean, do you think it's set in for him that the trial's actually starting yeah. in three weeks? Absolutely not. Now, I, I'm told that he does understand that um, this is not likely that he's going to win on appeal. It's a slim to none chance in trying to delay this further and that the trial will start in 21 days. Uh, but I don't think this is going to become real for him until we get much closer to it. And Caitlin, I have to say that sitting in that courtroom for him four days a week, it, there's going to be a pause on Wednesdays. But four days a week in, in this very dingy sort of bonfire of the vanities type courtroom um, is going to be a pretty interesting to watch. I mean, for someone, though, who kind of is described as stuck in the 1980s. Correct. Preserved people... in amber. Yeah. I, I, don't, I don't know that being stuck in the Manhattan criminal court is exactly was... <laughs> what he, how, how he had in mind uh, being that way. I mean, and it's not just physically being in court. It's also being there while Michael Cohen could be testifying, Correct. Stormy Daniels, Correct. Karen McTougal. I mean, all of these moments that did not go well for Trump in mm -hmm. the first year of his time in the White House, certainly not with his relationship with Melania Trump. You're getting to the point that a lot of his aides will talk about privately, which is that they they believe there is a chance of a hung jury. In this case, there's always a chance of a hung jury. And, this, you know, that's it just takes one. Um, they know and they believe that even if he's convicted, that it's not the worst fact set for him in, legally. Now, maybe that's true when you compare it to you know, a uh, uh, conspiracy to defraud the, the United States in terms of the J6 trial or the documents case in Florida. But it is a set of personal details that really get under his skin. As you noted, remember, he would, in White House meetings, just start talking about how, uh, you know, he, he didn't actually have an affair with Stormy Daniels, and he would ask people what they thought of uh, calling her horse face and on and on and on. And so this is going to get under his skin. What that means in terms of how he acts outside the courtroom, how he acts on the campaign trail, I think remains to be seen. But we have seen his ire with these cases bleed into his rallies. And I anticipate that will be the same because he's likely going to be doing events on weekends. Well, I mean, he could.